as we come before your throne this morning. Oh God, we need your Holy Spirit to come down and open our hearts and our minds. Father, pour out your grace upon us. Pour out your Spirit upon us. Anoint this preacher with feet of clay. Drive these truths home to our hearts, Lord God, that we may live for thee in this coming new year. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, beloved, 2018 is now in the books, and there's nothing you can do to change what you did. Amen? You see, folks, now it's all history, and it's recorded on the pages of time. Well, what are you saying to me, Pastor Joel? I'm saying this, that all of the triumphs and defeats of this past year, you hear what I said, triumphs also, and all of the defeats of this past year, All of the successes and failures of this past year, all of the pleasures and pains of this past year are now the good old days of antiquity in your life. Amen? You can look back and say, that was the good old days. Or the good old bad days. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But beloved, what was your life life, uh, like as you journeyed through that last year? In other words, I want you to think about 2018 for a moment, beloved. Are there some things that you could have and should have done better? Do you have any regrets or remorse about what you did? How was your moral and spiritual walk before the Lord last year? I'm asking you, did you uh, grow closer to Christ in 2018? I hope that you did. I hope you can say amen, Pastor. Beloved, were you as faithful to God? Were you as faithful to His church, the church, the body and bride and building of Christ? Were you as faithful to God and His church as you should have been? I'm asking you, is there anything you wish you could change in this new year? Now, I'm going to leave that to your own conscience. That was really a rhetorical question. You answer it. But I want you to listen to me, beloved. Last year is but a memory now, and it cannot be altered. Amen? No matter how much you want to do it, you can't do it. It cannot be altered. In other words, beloved, you cannot unring that bell no matter how hard you may try. A lot of people try to do it. They try to go back to, oh, if I could only do this, if I could only change that, if I could only, if I, if, if, if. And you can't. That's the bottom line, isn't it? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying the blast of the past is a die forever cast. I made that one up myself. How do you like that? I'm saying all of the joy and elations of your past year, beloved, all of the heartaches and sorrows you may have had this past year, all of your letdowns and disappointments of this past year, all of your shortcomings, all of the mistakes that you made in in this last and past year, all of your moral and spiritual guilt and the blame and the shame you may have for the things that you did in this last uh, year, beloved, they are all behind you now and you cannot change that. Am I right? Now, beloved, I'm trying to preach to you today because I want you to understand a lot of people are so living in the past, they can't even look ahead anymore. And Satan wants to beat you up. He wants to beat you up with your past, doesn't he? You know when you first got saved how you said, how did I ever do that? And Satan tried to overwhelm you with it. But God snatched you out of that pit, praise the Lord. You see, beloved, I'm saying these things of your past cannot be changed. So you mustn't dwell on them, beloved, unless they're going to ruin not only your present life, but they will ruin your future life because you'll start making all of the wrong decisions based on the past, and you don't want to do that. And so there's no future in the past is what I'm saying to you, ladies and gentlemen. It's all over and done with now, so forget about it. No, let me say it again like the mafia. Forget about it. (laughs) Forget about it. Say it. Forget about it. All right, now you got it. So what I'm saying is this here. You need to resolve in your heart that God has given you a brand new year to start over again. Amen? You see, beloved, God says, I want you to have a positive outlook and forget all the shoulda, woulda, couldas of the past that are behind you right now, beloved. All they're going to do is drag you down and you cannot change them. And so uh, you want your walk with God to be uh, uh, closer this year, don't you? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that the, all these things are going to do in the past, and I've seen it so often. People come to me, but Pastor Joel, this is what happened to me last year. And this is what, and, the, and that's the muck and the mire. It's like trying to get out of it. And if you ever walked in real mud, I remember when I was in the service and in the jungles, beloved, I'm telling you, it would suck your boots off. I mean, it would exhaust you because you've got to walk through there and you've got 100 pound packs on and it, just unbelievable. And that's what the past will do to you. It'll suck the strength and suck the life right out of you. So you need to purpose in your heart that through the grace of God and through the help of God this new year, beloved, this year is going to be much better than last year. Amen? 
that God in his great mercies will help you start over again and will help you right all of the wrongs of the last year. Now the Bible says this, if God be for you, who can be against you? If anyone wants you to succeed this year, it is Almighty God himself. He is for you. He's not against you. Now, the devil wants you to think he is, but God is for you, beloved. So, I'm saying you need to trust him, and he'll show you how to walk in victory this year. You need to trust him, and he's going to show you how to weather all of the storms and all of the valleys of this coming year. And believe me, you're going to have them. It's not all a bed of roses as a Christian. Through much tribulation, we shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, the Bible says. Amen? He didn't say through a little tribulation. He said through much tribulation. Why? Because we're different than this world. And Satan's doing everything he can to attack God's people and disrupt the work of God on this earth. So I'm saying you just trust him and he'll show you how to travel through this thing we call life and become an overcomer, beloved, and change your life. I mean, let's face it. Admit it to yourself. Say, I can't change my past. Say it to yourself. I can't change my past. Say it again. I can't change my past. I can't change what happened to me yesterday. I'm saying today is the tomorrow you spoke about yesterday, beloved, so you need to move forward into this uncharted territory of the new year with renewed faith and renewed hope and renewed trust in God. Now, we all quote Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. We all know it. But the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. What's he saying? He said, If you acknowledge me, I'll lead you. He's saying, if you acknowledge me, I will direct you. I will guide you. I'm saying that God will and can help you start over again this new year, just like he did here with Israel. And this is what I want to drive home today, so you can understand how God dealt with his Old Testament people and how he deals with his New Testament people. These things are written for our admonition, Paul says, upon whom the ends of the world have come, in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, and 11. So these things that happen to Israel, the Old Testament people, because God does not change, happens to Is, uh, the New Testament Israel or the church also. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, you need to behold God's new thing in your life this year. Now, let me give you a little background of these texts, beloved, and then what I want to do is apply it to our lives so we can live a, most, a more richer or fuller and productive life and hopefully turn over a new life this year. Beloved, the prospects of this new year are virtually endless with the Lord. There's victory to be had. There's triumph to be had. There's blessings to be had. And God wants you to know that. Now let me give you a little background so you can understand what Isaiah is dealing with right here, what he's saying, and fa uh, Father, and beloved, it'll help you. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Okay, <laughs> It'll help you grow as a Christian. Now, I know you, I've talked to you about this before, but let me just give it to you a basic history. In 922 B.C., the nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The ten tribes of the northern kingdom were under the leadership of Solomon's servant. His name was Jeroboam, and the capital of the northern kingdom was Samaria. You'll read about that all through the Old Testament. Samaria, Samaria. When God's saying that, he's talking about what kingdom? The northern kingdom, that's where the capital was, like Washington, D.C. of America. Whereas the two tribes of the southern kingdom were under the leadership of Rehoboam. Jeroboam, Rehoboam, and all the Boam brothers, right? Jeroboam was the son and successor of King Solomon. And beloved, they made their capital in Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. Now, God had both admonished and encouraged both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom that he wanted them to remain faithful to him but they both miserably failed. Beloved, the Bible says they both fell into rank idolatry and worshipped other gods. The Bible says they both fell into gross immorality and depravity and perversity. The Bible says that they reveled in unbridled sin and corruption and wickedness, and they both were unrighteous before God. They were disloyal to God, beloved, and they both ignored all of God's persistent overtures to correct them so they repent of their evil ways but they just would not listen to the voice of the prophets. God sent prophet after prophet after prophet to his people. Listen to me. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. And their ears flapped over. And by the way, a lot of people like that in the church too. Proverbs 29, 1 says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck, 
shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. In other words, if God is speaking to you and speaking to you and speaking to you and you won't listen and you won't change, God said, you step over that line, that's it. I won't give you any more grace. I won't give you any more mercy. He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. There's no remedy from it. There's no recovery from it. So it's serious business to play games with God, isn't it? And that's what Israel was doing. They'd now become so stiff-necked. The Bible says they were careless and callous. The Bible says they reveled in rebellion and disobedience. They were unfaithful to God, just like many Christians are in the church today, that they thought they could sin with immunity and impunity, beloved. But they were deceived. And sure, listen to me now, both kingdoms were God's people. See, God loved his people, but God cannot tolerate unrepentant sin. He can't do it. They were both God's people, but God warned that nothing but punitive judgment awaited them. But if they'd repent and return to Him, beloved, God would have removed it. And yet they still hardened their hearts even more, and they became morally and spiritually dull of hearing and totally ignored God's stern and sober warnings, just like many in the church. Week after week, as preachers get up and they preach and they tell their people, repent, get your life right, don't play with this, don't play with that. I was telling Brother Dave, uh, we were talking about demons. And, uh, and beloved, listen to me. Demon possession is real. But Christians say to me, Pastor Joel, but I can't be possessed. I don't have time to go into that right now, but you can be oppressed. Demon might not go in you, but he can go on you if you play with those things. And he'll stick to you like Velcro. And he'll make your life. You go back to those things you used to do, you'll be tormented by those things. And then ultimately, beloved, if you get so sinful, the Spirit of God leaves you, then you'll be possessed. And that's serious business. Remember Jesus talked about the demon going out of a man and that man was clean and he went through dry places and finally he says, hey, I'm going back home. It's nice and clean. There's nothing there. He didn't fill it up afterwards. So these things are real. And you can see Israel was playing with fire and they didn't even know it. They didn't even want to admit it. That's what we're dealing with right here uh, in these texts, ladies and gentlemen. So Isaiah spoke these prophecies to uh, the United Kingdom of Israel in 740 B.C. Now, when I say the United Kingdom, I mean Israel and uh, uh, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom, they were still God's people. That's what I mean by united. They had already been divided as far as God's people were concerned, but they were one people in God's sight. Now, when Isaiah wrote this, beloved, it was about 180 years after the nation had been divided. That is, into the northern and southern kingdom. Yet because of Israel's impenitent sin and apostasy, as you read the book of Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39 of this book, beloved, it foretold of God's impending judgment that was going to come upon this nation and why they had been divided now. In other words, God was going to show them how they'd now be driven from their homeland uh, 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 by God, and he would send them into Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. And sure enough, In 722 B.C., 18 years after Isaiah prophesied this, the northern kingdom was taken into Assyrian captivity. Beloved, there the northern kingdom was swallowed up by the Assyrians, and they ultimately lost their identity as Jews and God's people. In other words, the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes, ceased to exist. Then about 136 years later, you think that Judah, the southern kingdom, would have learned, Judah and Benjamin, you thought they would have learned after God dealt with Assyria, I mean the northern kingdom, and put them into Assyria. But they didn't learn. See, like us a lot of times, we think we're going to get away with it. We can sin with immunity and impunity. Ah, I got by this one. No, you didn't. See, Israel thought that, and they certainly didn't, beloved. But in 586 B.C., the southern kingdom of Israel was taken into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. God says, away from here. Get out of this homeland. But I love you, and I'm going to go with you. But God went with the southern kingdom into Babylon. Would you say amen? And there he sent prophet after prophet to them, beloved, to tell them that he still loved them and to assure all the penitent that someday he'd deliver them back from their Babylonian captivity, and he would bring them back into their homeland of Israel. Now, what was God's goal in this? God's goal was to try to salvage and save a righteous remnant who'd repent and return to them and ultimately bring forth Christ the Messiah who would come to redeem them and all of mankind. 
See, God has a redemptive plan, and no one can ever thwart God's plan. Would you say amen? So I want you to get a little understanding of what's going on here. So that's chapters uh, 1 through 39. Isaiah is putting their feet in the fire because of the things that they did. But beginning with Isaiah chapter 40 through 46, Isaiah starts changing his tune. In fact, if you read Isaiah 40 verse 1, we don't have time to go there, but he says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Why should I comfort them? Because they're in pain and heartache and hurting down there in Babylon. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. You see, beloved, he switches his tune. He goes from stern rebukes and warnings against Israel to now he gives them exhortations and promises of deliverance from their Babylonian captivity. Why did he do it? He wanted to comfort them. Why did he do it? He wanted to assure them. You see, beloved, what he wanted to do is let them know that, listen, you are going to come back home. I promised you that. And I told you I was going to send you your Messiah. Amen. And all through the book of Isaiah, from 40 to 6, chapter 40 to 66, you read about the coming of the Messiah. No other book in the Old Testament has as much information about the coming of Christ as the book of Isaiah. Would you say amen? He was a rich man. He was a prophet of God, beloved, high echelon, a, a man of urbane, urbane and learning. And then he got sawed in half, tradition says, because uh, of uh, the things that he preached. He, they put him inside a hollow out tree, put him in, and they cut him in half with a saw. Not a chainsaw, but a saw. But Isaiah assures them that this second exodus out of Babylonian captivity was going to be a greater deliverance than their first exodus from Egypt. So now God's people really needed to hear this comforting and assurance good news because they thought God had utterly abandoned them and rejected them because of their sin and apostasy. But Isaiah was sent by God to assure them and to comfort them that he hadn't. You know, beloved, some of you may feel like that today. Last year, you're living in sin. Last year, you're doing all kinds of things you ought not to do. But God told you, if you come to me, you come to, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Doesn't he say that in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5? I won't do it. But if you forsake him, beloved, listen to me. He says, then I will forsake you. So you don't want to forsake the Lord, amen? But to be the recipients of his blessing, bring back, beloved. First, you needed to repent. They needed to repent. And then they needed to return back to God. And God says, if they and we will do this, and he will welcome us back with open arms. Would you say Amen. So this is the background of these texts, just a brief background. These backsliders could and would now be able to have a fresh start in their life, and so can't you. 2019, brand new fresh start. Behold the new things God wants to do in your life this year. And beloved, uh, in order for us to understand this, listen to me, because no matter how much I've said this to people, in order to do this, beloved, if we'll but repent of our sins, we have to say, Lord, I renounce this. It is wrong before you. I know it's wrong. And if you don't renounce it, beloved, Satan will drive you crazy with it. Satan, I renounce you. Baptism, that's what you're doing. You're renouncing Satan and his ways, renouncing this world. You're saying, I want within the kingdom of light. Beloved, if you'll but uh, return to God, God says, draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you in James 4 a doesn't he? If you but recognize his promises, you'll then be able to behold God's new thing in your life this year. But how do we do it amidst all of our sin and guilt of the past year? But Pastor Joel, how in the world do we do it amidst all of our mistakes and our failures and our shortcomings of the past year? I feel so unworthy, so undeserving of it. You are. But how in the world do we do it, Pastor Joel, amidst all of our faults and our disobedience? Of the past year, for $375, I'll answer that question for you. Now, beloved, let me answer that question for you right out of these texts, because this is what God said to Israel. The first thing you must do is change your focus. The first thing you must do, listen to me now, is change your focus. You can't go like this and look back. You've got to go where? Look forward. You must change your focus. Look what he says in verse 18. He says, remember, remember ye not the former days, neither consider the things of old. Now those words, remember ye not, is the Hebrew word zakar. And they have both a positive and negative aspect to it. Now let me give them to you. 
Positively speaking, God was challenging Israel to remember and recall the Exodus and the wilderness experience. Remember ye not? Remember those things that I did before? In their Babylonian captivity, beloved, they had forgotten how God had supernaturally delivered them from their Egyptian captors in bondage and then ultimately supernaturally sustained them for the next 40 years out there in the wilderness, out there in the desert. There was no water out in the desert. There was no food out in the desert. There was no grass out in the desert for the cattle to eat. How in the world did God do it? Did he have truckload or camel load or camel load of uh, camels come in with grains of sack on their shoulders and meat and beef? Did he do that? No, he didn't do that, beloved. The Bible doesn't teach that. And yet the Bible does say their clothes did not rot nor their sandals wear away. God had his hand on them supernaturally, didn't he? The Bible says their food and drink was manna from heaven. It was meat from heaven. It was water from a rock out there in the wilderness. The Bible says their bodies were healthy and strong and he had taken all the disease from them because God's supernatural power and protection and provisions was upon them. And not only that, beloved, they were also able to defeat all of their enemies and they weren't trained soldiers. You know, Abraham trained his soldiers, the Bible says, 318 of them, right, when they rescued Lot. But they weren't trained soldiers and yet the Bible says they were able to defeat all of their enemies. How? Because the supernatural hand and arm of the Lord was upon them. Would you say amen? God's hand was upon them. God was in them, with them, through them. God was doing it. A lot of times we get so puffed up with ourselves. We think it's our education, our own strength, our own. And beloved, it's God using you as his vessel. That's all it is. You're just an earthen vessel. Amen. And so, beloved, what am I saying? God says, listen, you have forgotten the mighty and miraculous arm of the Lord in all this. So God reminds them of their past history uh, and saying, remember ye not. And beloved, how often we too forget this. Remember ye not God's divine power. Remember ye not God's divine providence and his promises to you. Remember ye not your deliverances in the past. Remember ye not God's faithfulness to you in the past. Those are the things we should look back on, amen? And we should always look back on that. But God did this despite all of your flaws and your faults and your failures. God didn't say, I intervened in your life because you were perfect. You were still imperfect, but you were my child, and I delivered you, and I helped you, and I was faithful to you. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, so God also says to us, remember ye not how I helped you back then? Oh, beloved, do you remember that? I can remember laying hands on my oil tank, honestly, and I'm not jiving when I say that to you. I didn't have a sixteenth of a tank of oil, and I was flat broke. And I told you, I've been burning it for the last 30-something years. <laughs> I don't buy oil anymore. No. But God sustained, and I kept listening to my furnace. And I said, this is it, this is it. My pipes are going to be, and it kept going and going and going until I could accrue some money. And beloved, remember you not how God healed you back then when you thought I'd never get better? Boy, I feel like dying right now. How about when he led you? You didn't know what to do, and yet God, in his faithfulness, in spite of your unfaithfulness, was still able to lead you and guide you, beloved. How about him sustaining you? You didn't have money for food. He provided it. You didn't have food. He provided that. He took care of you. He sustained you. Amen? So he says, if, you, if I did that in the past, fear ye not right now. Whatever you're going through, don't fear it right now. Remember ye not, I'm your divine shield and buckler. Remember ye not, I'm your divine helper and your deliverer. Remember ye not, I am your Lord and Savior, and I am your ever-present God. Would you say amen? So that's God positively speaking to them when he says, remember ye not. Now let's take the negative aspect of this, because this is where the central focus is. Negatively speaking, God was telling Israel, remember ye not, that is to forget your old past sinful mistakes. Remember ye not them. Remember ye not my judgments against you. Why, Lord? Because Isaiah is saying, a new day has now come. Hallelujah. In other words, he sent them into 70 years of captivity because of their impenitent sins, but now his punishments... But now their sufferings were over and done with. And God says, I want you to know that so you can move forward in your life. Come on and say amen out there. God says, I want you to know that. 
Because a lot of you are just reveling in the, somebody's beating you up. You see, beloved, he says that now, all these things of your past are ancient history as far as God is concerned. Isaiah was saying, now your moral and spiritual slate of sin and evil has now been cleansed, and so has ours through the blood of Christ. You see, beloved, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and uh, just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Now look at verse 25, if you would. God says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions. Now watch this. This is the reason. For mine own sake, and I will not remember thy sins. God's saying that in his great kindness, in his infinite mercy, he forgave them of all of their past sins. And then he says, here's the reason. I did it for my sake. Why, pastor? Lest his anger constantly and continuously burn against these sinners and his punitive judgment rest upon them and us too. In other words, God was saying, remember ye not, forget your sins. Remember ye not, Forget your moral and past, uh, spiritual past failures and your flaws and mistakes and your shortcomings. Remember ye not, forget about the mutiny you had against me. Remember ye not, forget about that Babylonian captivity. I want you to forget all things. Wipe them out of your mind. A new day has come. Would you say amen? Oh, beloved, I can't remember when I first read this. For year after, I don't make New Year's resolutions. I always set little goals. But I always said... I always quoted this, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I've said that thousands of times in my life. I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Thousands of times. Repeating it over and over for the last 40-something years. So, beloved, what God's saying? God says, now I'm going to fully pardon you. God is saying, now I'm going to renew my covenant with you. Now I'm going to deliver you from your bondage. I'm going to bring you back to your homeland in Israel. And right now I'm going to send your Messiah to you. And you'll see that old deliverance from Egypt is nothing compared to this new supernatural deliverance of you. In other words, from the very power and penalty of sin. I'm going to deliver you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I'm going to deliver you from the burning, boiling, bubbling fires of hell into the glories of heaven. In your Messiah, would you say amen? God said, I'm going to deliver you from the fear of death to the blessings and hope of immortality and eternal life in the eternal kingdom of God. So stop your fretting. Stop your worrying. Stop your anxiety. Stop your looking back. He's saying, and remember you not those things because they'll only discourage you and they'll only depress you. Remember you're not these things, because they'll only dispirit you. You won't want to go to fo- forward. You want to you wanna stay engaged in the spiritual battle. Remember ye not, God is saying. I don't want you to remember those things. Have hope in me. And so Isaiah was exhorting them to behold God's new things that he'd now do for them. You see, beloved, as far as God was concerned, for them and for us, a brand new time had come for them. A brand new day and focus had come for them. A brand new year had come for them, just like it does for us right now, doesn't it? Now they could have a new and a fresh start uh, uh, in this new year. You see, beloved, and so can you, by the way. And now they would begin again, and now they could start all over again, and now they could start making things right, and so can't you. All right, so you made some mistakes last year. All right, so you got yourself in some mire and and some sin, things you ought not to have done, but you don't have to stay there. God says, I'm willing to forgive you. I'm willing to put this behind you, but you have to turn from them. Turn to me. Would you say amen? Turn to me. Turn ye, turn ye, all ye ends of the earth. Look unto me. Look unto me, Isaiah says. Of course, he's speaking on behalf of God. You see, beloved, it was a time uh, that... uh, God says to me, can you imagine your slate right now is just white? See, the story of the new year hadn't been written for you yet. It's blank page. There's no chapter and verses in there. How are you going to write it? You know you're the captain of your boat. God is the boat. He's giving you the sail. He's giving you the water. He's giving you the wind. But you have to seal that with that rudder. Do you want to go this way or you want to go that way? You want to go back or you want to go forward? Which way do you want to go? 
See, you, you can't blame God. God says, I've given you everything that pertains on the life and godliness. I've given it to you already. It's already in the bag. It's a gift that I've already given to you. But what are you going to do with it? And so, beloved, God says, I've got a new time for you. A new time to rededicate your life to God. A new time to start again. A new time to fix that problem. A new time to right all the wrongs in your life. A new time to begin afresh and anew and again. Would you say amen? But often we also have the same problem as Israel. We say, what's that, Pastor? We keep casting our eyes backward like they did. I'll never go forward. I can't believe it. This is what I did. It'll always be like this. I can't see myself without that sin. I can't. See, we keep looking where? We keep casting our eyes backward, looking over our shoulder. God says, I don't want you to do that, Israel. I don't want you to do that, church. And so all that will do, beloved, is drag you down, and it will put such distress and disappointment and ultimately defeat in your life. You'll look back and say, if I didn't get victory last year, then it's certain I can't get victory this year. And that's not true. That's a lie you're telling yourself. It comes from the devil and even smells like smoke and out of hell. That's not true. God changed my life, beloved. He changed your life. Look at the things where you used to be. Did God do a work in your heart? A mighty work? A power? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Behold, all things have passed away, and all things become new. In, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Amen? So, beloved, you must keep on looking ahead. One day, Jesus had a bunch of disciples in front of him. And he's preaching to them. And these were some hard truths. You need to pick up your cross daily and follow me. Anyone that doesn't love, uh, loves father or mother or sister or brother or wife more than me is not worthy of me. So these were hard truths. And the Bible says that some of the disciples started walking away. And Jesus faced the crowd. And this is what he said in Luke 9, 62. He says, no man having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. You start looking back and your furrows start going like this, right? You don't know where you're going, where those oxen are going. No man having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Looking back to their past sins, looking back to the world, looking back to your old compromises, looking back to the way you used to live, looking back to the way you used to do things, looking back to your unfaithfulness, looking back to your disobedience. God said, you do that, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's serious business, isn't it? What was God saying? He said, I want you to change your focus. And that's what he wanted Israel to do, to change their focus. Stop looking over your shoulder. Stop looking back to 2018 or 2014 or 1940. Never mind. Stop looking back. That's what God is saying to them. Why, Pastor? I'll tell you why. Because if you constantly and continuously are looking back, beloved, to your past, then you will only see where you've been and not where you're going. You know, if you look back all the time, have, have you ever had a new car and the steering was just so, um, where am I looking, so responsive? And I know in my truck, you know, I have to go like this to turn a corner. <laughs> okay. But Ellie's, they go like this here. And I go right off the road. <laughs> but it's so responsive. It's rack and pinion and power rack and pinion. You just touch it and it goes everywhere. That's why on Wednesday nights when we come, it's the only time I drive that car. I says, this year, I'm going to learn this car. Okay. And she says, Joel, you're on the other side because you can't look away a second. You go, whoop. If I look like, and my hand goes that way, it goes right off. And this is what happens in our life. A little bit like that, a little bit like this. You go veering and veering. You should have been on the straight and narrow. But somehow you got on the broad road. God says, I don't want you looking back. I want you to look ahead, see where you're going. Not where you've been, see where you're going. Why, Pastor Joel? Because the quicksand of the past can be heavy and it can haunt you, beloved. It can haunt you with fear and worry and anxiety. It can haunt you with trouble and disappointment. It can literally haunt you with feelings of failure and hopelessness, beloved. And it can also rob you of your joy. And the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation, King David said. Oh, beloved, when you're happy, you're following the Lord. You, you're doing the right things. You, you feel His nearness, His dearness to you, His presence in your life. You know that you're in the company, in the presence of Almighty God. Amen. You know, happy people are motivated 
and they're enthusiastic about the future, beloved, but sad people. Those who are melancholy folks are discouraged that they're so discouraged, I should say, that they're apathetic and indifferent about it and they're deterred from ever going forward. What's the use? Things were like this, they'll always be like this. I never think like that. Never. I can honestly tell you, I never think like I told you. I was in a football game. It was two minutes left to go in the game, and our team was down 30 points. I said, come on, fellas, we can do it. And they all looked at me. <laughs> down 30 points. I'm almost ashamed to say it, but then we were. We were down 30 points. Stupid mistakes, and that's all it takes. Fumble here, uh, interception there. You can play a good game and lose. Uh, if you've ever played football, you know that. But anyways, well, look at verse 18 again. He says, remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Now, the, uh, what I want you to see here, <coughs> excuse me, but when God says the former things, it's the <coughs> Hebrew word rishon, and it means the old things, the previous things, <coughs> excuse me, it means the before things, that is those past things that you cannot change that may frighten or disgust you right now. They may so discourage you from trying to presently move ahead and to change your life in the future. You see, they're the before things in your life. But this is after now, amen? Those, those other things, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to get rid of. You've got to forget about those things, and you've got to move ahead. God's saying to Israel, change your focus. Forget your former failures and success of the past. Forget your former bondage. Forget your former deliverance and exodus and victories. Forget your former activity, the good things and the bad things. I want you to forget all those things of the past. God's saying, I want you to forget your captivity and judgments and the times of plenty you had in your life and forget the times of poverty you had in your life. And I'm sure you want to remember the good times and the joy, but I want you to forget them right now. There's better days ahead and forget those painful things too while you're at it. Forget that whole past. It's done. It's over with. Flush it. Goes down the drain. I almost said something else. I had somebody get offended me one time because I said, oh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> you know, uh, but anyways, beloved, God says, listen, it's over and done with. You can't change it, neither can, uh, I, God said in Israel, you can't change it, and neither can we, by the way. So verse 18 says, not only remember the form, don't remember the former things, but notice he says, and consider not. Yeah, the word consider is the Hebrew word being. It means don't look back at them. Don't fix and focus your attention on them. Don't think about the uh, so-called good old days in your life, good, bad, or indifferent. Now, we all may have some cherished memories, and, and beloved, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you're not living back there, understand? Do you know that sometimes, now listen to me, focusing on past success can hinder your forward progress as much as focusing on past failures. Did you know that? You look back. I look back, beloved, in my life, and I started with nothing in my business. But then after five years, I started making some money, and then I opened up a couple other stores. You know, I thought I was going to be a millionaire before I was 30. What I found out was I was going to be poverty-stricken. So you, you become a minister, and people pray. They say, Lord, keep them humble. We'll keep them poor. No, okay. <laughs> but, but, beloved, I, I, there's some fond memories that I had back then. Now, they were tough the first five years. I've got to tell you that. Uh, but I don't want to go back to that. But how is it our past successes can ruin uh, 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 or cause failure in our life, beloved? Because of this. Now listen. It can put the fear of failure in you to now try new things that you may not want to try because of your past ones were so successful and you're afraid that these may not be as successful. You say, I'm not going to try it again. I'm not going to fall on my face. I remember all of the work that I had to put into it. So success sometimes can ruin you. And then you get into what is known as analysis paralysis. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? How did I do that? I don't know if I should do this again. You know, it's going to take a lot of time. I'm going to have to spend a lot of time there. I'm going to be there early in the morning, late at night. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to do everything. So you get into paralysis analysis, and you don't want to do anything. Amen? So it stops you from doing anything. I'm saying, beloved, your past success can sometimes make you too afraid to go forward. You hear me now. A lot of people have had this. It can make you apprehensive to now step out in faith and try new things. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying don't look back. What am I saying to you? I'm saying don't think back. What am I saying to you? I'm saying don't go back, beloved. Remember not your former sins. 
Remember not your former failures and mistakes and the guilt and the shame. God says, remember not your former slip-ups. You slipped up. You did it. Fess up. And let's get going. Pick up yourself. Swipe yourself off. And let's go ahead. Would you say amen? Remember you not your past disobedience. Rebellious and I had to slap you around a little bit. Now I'm going to shake you out and clean you off and put you in the right direction. Remember you're not. Me not your unfaithfulness to me this last and past year in your life. So stop rehearsing them over and over again in your life. What do we do with the past? I've always taught you. You need to look at the past, and then you need to learn from the past, but then you need to leave the past behind, and you need to start looking ahead to the future. Uh Uh-huh, I did that wrong, I did this wrong, whatever. This is what I did right, and you know what? That's done and gone. I'm going to look this way. I'm not going to repeat the same mistake over and over again. And you're looking ahead to better times, brighter times that God will give in your life. I'm saying this. Learn to spurn and burn your past bridges that will always seem to beckon you to go back to the chains and the guilt and the shame and the failures of the past. Burn those bridges in your life. Get rid of them. Brand new day in the Lord. They're only going to cause you more headaches and heartaches, beloved. So let them be burned and buried in the past. In other words, God's saying, I want you to change your focus. What's your focus like? Are you always looking back or looking ahead? And when you look ahead, what do you see? The same as the past? See, you're judging the future by the what? You're judging the future by the past. But God says there's no future in the past. None. Even as a righteous man, Ezekiel 3, Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 33, says a righteous man, if he falls into sin, God won't remember his righteousness no more unless he repents. Right? See, it's always with God forward. Amen? It's always with God forward. It isn't your new birth that saves you. It's whether or not you're still walking in the grace of the new birth. So, beloved, that was point number one. Change your focus. It was God saying to Israel and what God is saying to us in 2019. Number two, God is saying, I want you to clarify your focus. I want you to clarify your focus. He says in verse 19a, he says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now the word behold is the Hebrew word asah. And it means to keep on watching. Keep on observing. Fix and focus your undivided attention on me, your God. And what I will now do for you. God's saying to Israel and God's saying to us, he's saying, behold, that is stop, look, listen to my twofold promise. I want you to zero in on it. I want you to zoom in on it so you can clarify what I want to do in your life and what I want you to do for me in your life. Would you say amen? Clarify this, put it before you so you can see what it is. I've always told you the sculptor does not add to that statue, that piece of clay. He chisels away at it to get down to the bare essentials. So he can make that form or that figure that he wants. Would you say amen? That's what you need to do in your life. Chisel it away. Prioritize your life. Do the things you need to do. God says, behold, I will do a new thing in your life. So God's charge here, ladies and gentlemen, is not for us to focus on what he's already done in our life, but on what he's doing and yet going to do in our life. God's saying this. He's saying something like this. He's saying, behold, listen up. What is it you want me to do for you? Now listen, he's saying right now. What is it you want me to do for you right now? Now he's no genie in the bottle, but he's our heavenly father. He's Abba. Amen. God says, what is it in your life right now? Not I want a million dollars. What is it I can, how can I clean up your life for you? How can I make your life easier for you? What is it you want me to do for you right now? Is your heart right before me? Are you using the grace of God in vain or are you using it aright in your life? That's what God is saying, amen? You see, beloved, God is saying in verse 19a, God says to Israel and us, here's my twofold promise to you that I want you to focus on Uh, in on and clarify in your mind also, and I want you to embrace it this year. The first thing he shows us is, I want you to focus in on my new thing. You see what he says there? Behold, I will do a what? New thing. I want you to focus in on my new thing, a hadash. Now what does that word hadash mean? God says, I want you to focus in on my fresh things that I want to do in your life. I want you to focus in on the novel things that I want to do. The 
different things that I want to do in your life, different than the things you've already experienced in the past. Before you had defeat, I'm now going to give you victory. Before you had poverty, now I'm going to provide for you. I want you to focus in. I want you to clarify it in your mind. I want you to see what it is, and I want you to come to the throne with it and beseech my throne so I can do it for you. How's that sound? Now, for Israel, beloved, I told you, what did this mean? This meant, here they are languishing in Babylonian captivity. No hope of ever going home. The city of Jerusalem has been ruined. It's been razed to the ground. There's no temple anymore. There's no wall anymore. There's no buildings in the city anymore. They have been transported now about 700 miles away into Babylon. And God says, tell them, Isaiah, tell them they're coming home. For Israel, it meant they were going to come home, back to their homeland, rebuild the temple, rebuild the city of Jerusalem, and their Messiah was going to come and redeem them and redeem the whole world. And they would be supernaturally delivered, beloved. And God even put Rome over them to protect them. You know, people look at uh, Israel and the Romans sometimes abuse them, beloved. You know, but God was really protecting them. They had the great Pax Romana in those days. The Roman peace, the roads were safe because the troops were always guarding it. The cities were somewhat safe. The countryside was somewhat safe. And Israel had all kinds of freedom to worship the way they wanted to under the Romans. All the Romans wanted was their money. You pay the taxes, you're fine. That's why the Christmas story, I love it, is in those days when, when uh, Caesar raised the taxes. You know, you can thank God, politicians, for the only time they raised taxes, right? <laughs> so Jesus would get to where he needed to go to be born, in Bethlehem. But, beloved, what, I, what, I, what I'm saying to you is this here, it meant that now God was going to do a new thing for them. And for us, it means discovering what that new thing that God wants to do uh, for you and in your life this year, beloved. So you need to clarify that. What are you saying, Pastor Joy? I'm saying you can't live on yesterday's faith. You can't do it. You can't live on yesterday's failures or yesterday's successes in your life. Beloved, honestly, good, bad, or indifferent, every time I preach, I always say, Lord, let me make this one more anointed than the last one. In other words, let me, let me own this sermon. Let, speak to me, in me, with me, through me, to the people. Arrest their attention. Arrest their hearts. Glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone, I'm just excited about it. Uh, when I get up here, believe it or not, beloved, I'm a very mild-mannered reporter. But when I get up here, God just says, tell them, Joel. And he's, he's rebellious. And I'm only kidding. <laughs> you see, beloved, you can't live on yesterday's guilt or shame either. Oh, woe is me. Well, you can't live on yesterday's mistakes. You made some mistakes. Things that hurt you the most teach you the most. Get up. Get going. Amen. See, a new day is coming. It's time for you to start over. And God says, I'm giving you a new chance, a new break, a new opportunity. A new challenge to change things in your life. So make the most of it. And beloved, sure, we all have past memories and we have uh, uh, past regrets and past shame and guilt. I'm not saying that. But now it's time to focus in on the I wills and the I cans and the I ams. What do you mean, Pastor? I will read and pray and study my Bible more this year. I will do it. Like I will be more faithful to God. I will be more faithful to church this year. I will do it. I will conquer my besetting sins this year. I can do it. Why? Because I know Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. Amen. I can do it. So you need to clarify your focus, beloved. Zero in on what God wants you to do in your life right now. You see, God wants you to know it, he says. Shall you not know it? God wants you to see it. He wants you to do it. He wants you to experience it. Behold the God's new things. So what have I taught you so far? How do I come into this new year? Number one, you need to change your focus. Number two, you need to clarify your focus. And let me end with this. Number three, you need to concentrate uh, concentrate your focus. Look at verse 19b. He says, I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I will even make a way. That phrase is one word in the Hebrew. It's the word sum. 
That is, God promises to personally, now listen to me, and supernaturally create and appoint and ordain a brand new way in your life, a brand new course and path in your life, a brand new direction and opportunity for you to take in your life right now that hither uh, afore, beloved, seems so impossible to you, like making a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. How many times have you seen rivers in the desert? People have seen mirages, but they've never seen rivers. Normally when you go in the desert, it's nothing but soft sand. But somehow, somehow, God made a way for Israel to travel and all the people and provided grass to boot. Now, I don't understand it. I'll tell you right now. I don't understand it. I've been in enough deserts to see that not much grass grows in sand. But I've never seen water come out of a rock either. I've never seen an axe head float either, have you? And yet God can do it. You say, Pastor Joel, how will he do it? Well, beloved, this is interesting because in verse 19, God figuratively, figuratively uses these three words to describe how is he going to do it. Number one, he's, he talks about the wilderness, midbar. That is the uninhabited and desolate places. Number two, he says rivers, naha, that is streams of life-giving water. And number three, he says desert, yeshimon, that is the dry, solitary wastelands. In other words, God's saying this. Do you remember your forefathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt? Do you remember that? Uh-huh. Good. It would have been an 11-day trip from Egypt into Canaan. But you see, I had to train them. I had to bring them to the foot of Mount Sinai for a year and 17 days so they could study the Word of God, they could hear my will. They could learn how to worship me. So I could train them. So we took the long route. But you see, in the wilderness, there's no food, there's no water, there's none of that. There's no people to help you out there. But I'm going to take care of you. Behold, I will do a what? New thing! Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness, he says, in rivers in the desert. So what I want you to do is concentrate your focus on my person and power and promises. For I am about to do mighty and miraculous supernatural things for you right now, like I said. And beloved, to Israel, this was recalling everything that they had gone through in their wilderness experience when they were brought out of the land of Egypt. Amen? You can just see the rich history that they're looking back on, and they're saying, you know what? Yeah, that's true. Sure, they had leeks and cucumbers and garlic and the garlic down there in Egypt. But you know what? They ate pretty good out in the wilderness, too, and they never got sick. And then he brought them into the land of Canaan, houses that they did not build, drank out of wells they did not dig, beloved. They ate out of crops they did not plant. God supernaturally took care of them. And they were able to defeat all the Rephaims and the Zenzimims and the Nephaims. These were all giants in the land. And we were as little grasshoppers. And it's amazing to me, the irony of it, God sent the little King David to kill all the giants, beginning with Goliath. Isn't it amazing? And he rocked him to sleep. <laughs> Imagine getting hit between the eyes with a rock coming at about 130 miles an hour. Whack! <laughs> there goes your sword. There goes your spear like a weaver's beam, 125 pounds. Imagine getting hit with that. You see what God's saying to these people, beloved, is this here. God's saying to us, I should say, I'm about to supernaturally change and transform the landscape of your life also, like I did with the children of Israel. God's going to transform the landscape of your life. But you have to let Him. See, so you have to cooperate with Him. Beloved, it, it, it only goes to reason. If you don't cooperate with your boss, you don't cooperate with anything in life, well, you're, going to, you're going to be kicking against the pricks or the ox goads. Amen? So God says, that's what I want to do. God's saying this to you and I. In those desolate wilderness areas of your life, I'll now supernaturally inhabit them with more grace, more power, more spirit. Oh, behold the goodness of God in your life, beloved. Those new things that he's doing in your life. God's saying to you and I, those desert and, uh, desert and uh, dry wastelands of your life, uh, you walk with me now, I'll start supernaturally walking with you, and I'll provide fresh new hope and joy and life into your soul. Oh, behold. 
the newness of God in your life, beloved, the blessings that God has given you in your life. Those new things God's saying to you and I in those dry areas. And a lot of Christians have dry areas, beloved, desert areas, those stale and stagnant, dried up riverbeds of service and dedication and consecration in your life. God says, I'll now supernaturally bring forth. Notice what he says, beloved. He uses the word, not a river. He uses the word rivers, plural. That is of many new streams of blessing in your life. Oh, behold, that new thing God wants to do in your life. You may feel your past has made you and your life a wasteland, beloved, or a desert, but God says, I want to pour out new streams of blessings into your life this year. Won't you let me? Oh, behold, beloved, God's new thing. Boy, that's the attitude you've got to have. Amen? So he's saying, I don't want you to quit. I don't want you to give up. All right, you made some mistakes. I don't want you to quit. I want you to give up. I don't want you to lose heart, and I don't want you to lose hope. Instead, what I want you to do is to internalize what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Paul said this. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and looking forward unto those things which are ahead, listen, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Now, beloved, what's he saying? He's saying, I'll forget my past arrest of Christians. That's a horrible memory to me. Paul's saying, I'll forget my past persecution and imprisonment of Christians. I'll forget my past killing of Christians, and I'll forget my moral and spiritual flaws and faults and foibles, and I'll forget all of my sins, and I'll forget all of my successes, and I'll forget all of my uh, failures that I made in my life. The memory of these things, he's saying, is just too painful for me, and they'll stop me from going ahead as a great apostle and do the work that God wants me to do. I will not look back on those things, and neither should you. Can you imagine carrying that weight around, beloved? You're an apostle of God now. You've been persecuting, killing Christians, butchering them, bringing them into jail. The first Christian martyr, Stephen, beloved, he, and Paul's holding the clothes and they're stoning him to death. And then Paul gets saved. Can you imagine the conscience, the quicksand of his mind, how it must have haunted him? And Satan said, you kill Christians, you kill Christians. Listen, yeah, what, kind, what makes you think you're such a good apostle? You kill Christians, you kill Christians. Paul says, I forget those things. I know they're under the blood. And I know in whom I have believed. How about you? Paul said, I'm not going to let these things deter me from my goal, and neither should you let them do that, beloved. So what have I taught you so far? I've taught you, beloved, if you're going to behold God new, God's new things, you need to change your focus. You need to clarify your focus. And then you need to con your folks focus concentrate concentrate same thing focus on what focus on God focus on what God's forgiveness focus on what God's mercy focus on what God's grace focus on what God's blessing where's your focus it should be in God amen and I want you to focus on what God's going to do for you this new year. So Paul says, I'm going to go forward in my life. Paul says, I'm looking forward to a fresh start. Are you? I'm looking forward, Paul says, to victory and the resurrection. I'm looking forward to going to heaven. I'm looking forward to having eternal life and living in the eternal kingdom of God forever and ever and ever. Behold God's new thing in your life this year. Don't look back. Come ahead. Let's go to the...